Welcome. Welcome to this, the worship recording for August 23rd, 2020. Jesus told his disciples that do not be afraid, for whenever two or more are gathered in his name, there he will be in the midst of them. Now, I know at this time when we're recording this service, it's just me here at the moment, but since we are together, online, virtually, however it may be, I think that counts as at least two. So as we welcome Jesus into our midst through the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask that God may dwell richly with you and connect with you this day and always. Thank you. Grace to you and peace from God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed and eternal one, 
Son of the living God. Amen. Let us join together in our opening song of praise. when I was uh, even in grade school. 
So I know that that is within us. And then it got me thinking that that's just like the power of sin in our life. That chicken pox that infected me when I was maybe eight years old or nine years old, well, that virus doesn't go away. And it's just waiting for an opportunity to manifest, manifest itself within me. And hopefully this vaccine will help prevent that. The power of sin is always looking for a way, almost as though it's a sentient being. I just know maybe it's because, you know, that bad guy downstairs is pulling the strings, that it too is always looking for an opportunity to lead us astray, to get us in trouble, to have us do things that we know we shouldn't be doing or don't want to do, like Paul says, but yet he finds themselves, those are the very things that he does. But who will save this miserable wretch that he is, Paul says, or that I am? Praise be to God that Jesus Christ came among us. And so, in a sense, as we join together in our prayer today, may it be a booster flu shot or a booster sin shot for all of us this day. And let us pray. O oh God, it is on the rock of faith of our forebears that we have built our trust in you. We are indeed your people, and we know that you will not turn your face from us as we come in humble confession this day. Even so, there are too many times when we have presumed to go our own way, when we have acknowledged you as Lord of our life, but then done that which we know is against what you hold as right and true. Forgive us, O Lord, when we fail to listen to the wisdom of others and their experience of your life, closing our ears to their learning of you because it sits uneasily with our view. Forgive us once again and grant us your grace. Amen. Amen. And let us continue with our personal prayers before God at this time. And let us pray. Jesus, the Son of God, came to us who are sinners that we might know God does not condemn us, but in love sets us free from the burden of our guilt. God's message of forgiveness in Christ Jesus is assurance new life, and eternal hope. Thanks be to God for this precious gift made real to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, believe this good news and let us go forth to live in peace. And may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, live in our hearts and our minds as we worship this day. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us take this opportunity to share the peace of Christ with those with whom we are gathered or with those with whom we are in touch this day. Text, email, phone, mental telepathy, if you've developed that skill, which I don't think anyone has, in any event, may God richly bless us this day and always. Amen. Will you reach the host instead? Shall you
Thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and by which he showed his holiness. ruh -roh. We will continue in our story of Moses and God by the Numbers next week. Let us turn now to our New Testament reading that we find in Romans chapter 12, the first eight verses. Some of the best verses going in the New Testament. There's so many, of course, but these are pretty good. Hear now the word of God also. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Welcome everyone today, and I hope you're still having a good summer. Look, we got our friend, Mr. CB, and well, he comes from actually the West Coast, where his mommy, Lieutenant Jen, when she was in the Navy, uh, was a CB and did all kinds of construction jobs for the Navy. In any event, but Mr. CB is like a yellow jacket kind of bee. And look at this, he has a little stinger on his, uh, well, posterior side, so to speak. It turns out that, here, Mr. CB, why don't you go back and join your friends, okay? Don't sting me. I say this because during this past week, there was a yellow jacket nest in a place where it just couldn't be because the bees would sting other people. And so, well, we had to deal with that. And I thought, you know, if only I could be like Dr. Doolittle and talk to the animals and explain to the little yellow jackets that if they would just build a nest somewhere else, then everybody would be happy and safe. Well, it turns out they don't speak English and I don't speak yellow jacket. And I got to thinking that, you know, that's like with us and God. In that, if we could just but listen to God and do the right thing, the world would be a much better place. But we don't really always understand what God is asking or what God is saying. And so in order to do what God had to do to make us better, God had to send Jesus to be one of us. Imagine if I could have become a yellow jacket and gone into the little hive there and said, buzz, 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 translated me. We got to go somewhere else because this place isn't safe anymore. Oh, man, it would have been so much better. 
but I couldn't become a yellow jacket. But God could become one of us. And God, in the form of Jesus, in the person of Jesus, walked among us and taught us and loved us and eventually gave his life for us so that we might have abundant life and live with God forever. So let's think about that. That even at times when we don't understand what God is doing in our lives, it doesn't mean that God doesn't care and that God isn't looking to communicate and talk to us. We just have to figure out a little better on how that's working. Shall we? Buzz, 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 and let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for, well, taking the effort to become a human being. For there is no other way in which, well, you could have healed us of our sickness. A sickness we call sin, that even as we as children don't always fully understand, but it's in there. Thank you, Lord. This day and always help us to figure out how you're talking to us so that, well, we can love you in return and grow up to be your children. This day and always, we thank you in Jesus' name. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Amen. Amen. Uh, you had your uh, target circle. 
that when you got to a spot or a grid square that you wanted to test, you would press down a button and then hit the, hit the depth charge button. And if it was on a sub, it would light up. And if not, it would just remain dark. And of course, if you were sweeping around, you had to be very careful. If your cursor came across one of the hidden mines, it would make this buzzing sound. And then you knew that, well, you're in trouble. You won the game by either finding your opponent's eight submarines, or if the other opponent happened to stumble upon your four mines, and then that was when the game was over. It was a lot of fun, as well as nerve-wracking all at once to watch how close the other player came to finding a submarine or hitting a mine because you could monitor the other player's progress because in the corner, opposite corners, you had a little plastic periscope that would pull up, you turn it around and you could look in it through mirrors and see underneath the sonar screen to where the other player's cursor was going. Oh man, I gotta tell you, you know, they'd be missing mines by this much or, or check a grid that was next to where your submarine was and, and then, you know, you'd be safe. But basically, Mattel took the proven concept of Battleship, the popular game Battleship, and augmented it into a new game that was fairly fancy at the time. Nevertheless, I still recall how nervous I was of making some misstep while carefully navigating through the simulated mine-infested waters of my opponent and the thrill it was to experience the target circle when it lit up, when we actually found an opponent's submarine. It occurred to me this past week that since mid-March, we have been playing a type of sonar sub-hunt on a global scale as we navigate through the mine-infested waters of real-life racing, in this case, to produce a vaccine except today that the hazards could be any one of us. There's just, just not four minds we have to deal with. It could really be any one of us who might be asymptomatic, but yet still carrying the virus within us. Admittedly, our risk potential in our neck of the woods has been greatly reduced, thanks be to God, due to all the restrictions that have been implemented to date, and they seem to be working. But that simply means that we are still heading towards the next new normal, whatever that may look like. Still, to be in process on that way can bring with it times of anxiety and consternation as the end result has yet to be determined or even within view, so to speak. And any misstep, intentional or not, can have unforeseen consequences that we would have normally anticipated. And yet, in this case, we didn't, because it's new. Like contracting the virus from some casual source and having it cause a significant medical problem. Even if the vast majority of those affected seem to be getting by without too many ill effects, thanks be to God. Thus, when we join the Israelites in God by the numbers for today, I get similar types of feelings and emotions as I did with the game Sonar Sub Hunt playing in my youth. Except to say, the Israelites are not in the midst of a pandemic. They're not even close to the sea. Nor are they playing an ancient Near East version of Battleship. Still in all, they are in a sense in a type of quarantine, for real. For as such, their quarantine has been going on for about 38 years by my count. And the field or the sphere of quarantine is the wilderness of Sinai, through which they have been wandering, waiting for the next generation to grow up so as to be allowed to enter into the promised land. Even so, after 38 years of manna and quarantine, that's a long time. It's not surprising that the Israelites may be getting a bit anxious or grumpy, 
now and then as a bit on edge, especially now they're on the move in a new spot. And now they're in a spot that has no water. I'm thinking that the Israelites are reapproaching the plains of Moab, where from a spot 38 years before, the 12 spies gave the report, and the people rejected the plan of moving into the promised land. And so God sent them back into the wilderness until this next generation could come along. Anyway, from the plains of Moab, they're on the southern edge and they're approaching so that they can get ready to stage a crossing into the Promised Land across the River Jordan. But now, in our text, they have just come to the outskirts of a region called the Wilderness of Zin. And to give some perspective, let's say when they're encamped in Sinai, spending their 38 years, Let's say they're probably in South Carolina or Georgia. And now they're moving up towards us, assuming, of course, that New Jersey is the promised land where we are. And they're probably made it as far as Baltimore. But yet, they're on the move. And with an estimated crowd, at least by my estimation, of around 2 million men, women, and children, in addition to the livestock, well, if you don't have water, you need a lot of water in order to get everyone to work properly and really even to survive and have some sense of security. Food and water are basic elements of our own personal security. Plus, up until this time, Moses had his siblings with which to well rely on and to be with. But now in the opening verse of our text, we read that Moses' older sister, Miriam, has just passed away. Miriam is the one who first arranged with Pharaoh's daughter to hire their mom out to take care of Moses when he was found in a basket in the Nile River. Miriam was pretty smart. She watched as the basket floated stayed in the background. And then when Moses, uh, Pharaoh's daughter discovered Moses in the bulrushes and decided that she would adopt him, she came up and said, well, would you like someone that I know who could nurse the baby until he is weaned so that then you could then raise him up? And she said, oh boy, that sounds like a great plan. And so Miriam brought Moses back to their mother so that family was able to be together during a time when all the firstborn sons, well, were not allowed to exist. As a result, there are plenty of factors working against having a harmonious time in the wilderness of Zim. And the people are complaining, even so much or as far as to say, let us get back to Egypt where our, our kin or our ancestors had enough to eat and water to drink. So what do Moses and Aaron do when people complain and quarrel? Well, of course, they do what they always did and take the complaint directly to God. And they came to the tent of meeting, which has been you know, reestablished and set up because it's portable, and they fell on their faces to inquire of the Lord. Whereupon the Lord did not disappoint and instructs Mo, instructed Moses and Aaron to take Aaron's staff, assemble the congregation, and command the rock that was there to yield its water. Except for whatever reason, Moses switched it up a bit. By taking the staff, gathering the assembly, speaking to the people rather rudely, I might add, and striking the rock twice with his staff. No big deal, one might think. But yet, it was a big deal. For the Lord then said to both Moses and Aaron that because they did not trust in him to show God's holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, that they would not be the ones to lead the Israelites into the promised land. It was like they double faulted at match point in tennis and lost, 
right at the end. They got that far. Or they made a critical error in the last two minutes of a football game and lost because time ran out under the pressure that those last two minutes often bring. And now we learn also that by the end of chapter 20, beyond just beyond our text, Aaron also passes away, leaving Moses without his older sister and his younger brother in a relatively short time. So Moses is penalized because he messed up and mixed up God's instructions by speaking to the people and striking the rock instead of the other way around. Maybe he had a senior moment between the tent of meeting and the quarreling, crabby people. After all, Moses, I think, is around 120 years old at this point. Forty years growing up in Pharaoh's household. Forty years in the wilderness being a sheep herder and then being sent by God and now 40 years leading the people to their new life in the promised land. So maybe he was having a bad day. Maybe the quarreling of the people had finally got to them. His sister Miriam had recently died. Maybe he got mixed up with bringing the water from a rock in Exodus 17 on their way to Sinai when he actually struck the rock that time. Maybe even Moses had had enough like all humans do at some point, and he became frustrated and said, fine, you want water? Well, here you go. Whoop, whoop. And it was the wrong thing to do. But I really do not see that we've been given enough information in our text to easily observe Moses and Aaron intentionally doing this and trying to hide the glory of God and the holiness of God. Commentators who hypothesize as such do so as a result of what occurred afterward and they work backwards. Many commentators seem to backward engineer this passage to show how Moses was trying to claim credit for himself for the miracle of the water. I just don't think we have enough data to support that. Whatever the case, I have often felt that while Moses did something wrong for sure, because he got in trouble, none of us would have or could have done any better at all. And so what to do? Make Moses resign like we do now when someone messes up on a television broadcast by saying something stupid and embarrassing? And yet, God did not fire Moses. To fire someone by God at that point meant that he would go the way of Aaron and Miriam. But rather, God sort of retired Moses, such that by the end of the next book, Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Torah, God took Moses by the hand and showed him the end goal of all his efforts, the promised land. It reads like this in Deuteronomy. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab. See, they got to the plains of Moab. To the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land. From Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali and the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob when I said I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. So in the end, Moses still completed his mission. Moses did what God had wanted him to do. To me, it seems more like God is saying to Moses, 
Well, old friend, I can tell that it's time for you to come home. Well done, good and faithful servant. And somehow, like the giving tree that we talked about more than, oh gosh, a few weeks ago, I think Moses was happy. He had fought the good fight. And in spite of this water from the rock incident, he had done an outstanding job. I also think we can infer this by the role of Moses found in the New Testament. For Moses is the one with whom the Torah and the law is associated. When Jesus ever had a dispute with the scribes or the Pharisees, he would say, well, what did Moses tell you? Or they would come to him and say, well, Moses tells us this, but what do you say? And then just Jesus always worked them right around in circles until they couldn't see straight. Oh, my goodness. Especially, Moses did an outstanding job because he was the one who met God on Sinai to receive the tablets of stone in the first place that gave the law. Think about it. How many human beings can say they actually met God, spoke with God, and God answered them, and then they lived? Not many at all. Moses, representing the law, is one of two figures in the Old Testament who met with Jesus on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, along with Elijah, who represented the prophets. Moses represented the law, Elijah represented the prophets. Jesus met with them to show that he is fulfilling the law and the prophets. Many scholars would argue that the Gospel of Matthew was written for new Jewish Christian converts, and that Jesus was presented as a type of new Moses. All Jewish converts knew who Moses was. They were taught since birth. And in a sense, Jesus too was presented as a new and improved Moses, so to speak. Miraculous birth, um, a prophet, a priest, and a king, the whole package since Moses was one of the absolute greatest and well-known figures of Old Testament history. Not bad for Moses, an adopted son of Pharaoh, turned fugitive from justice, turned sheep herder in exile, turned leader of the newly reformed children of Israel, spanning the tradition from slavery into freedom. So even when we mess up, and mess up bad, and we certainly shall, God does not cast us aside, but walks with us, even as we are in our own time of exile. And in a sense, we still are in that exile at this moment. But as with the children of Israel entering the promised land, it wasn't a cakewalk in the park, and it won't be easy, but they were okay. We will be okay. We are certainly going to mess up some more along the way. And while messing up makes a mess that still has to be cleaned up, we need to keep our vision on getting past this and arriving at the place where we can live in safety, where we can be healthy, where we can educate our children in the way in which we would like that we can play sports, dine indoors, be a worshiping community to help our neighbors. Or in other words, so that we can be the children of God in this time and in this place without having to say, hey, you sunk my battleship. Let's think about that and let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus, you call us to be in the world, but yet not of the world. Help us to know that you have the faith in us to be your people, so that, so that if we but put our trust in you, that we can accomplish great things for your coming kingdom. 
a kingdom that is already established by your work on the cross, but still waits with expectation to be fully realized. Help us to put our faith into action in our everyday lives toward each other, so that we may complete our faith in you. For it is in your name in which we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. And as we now move to respond to God's love, let us do so by affirming our faith by using the words of the Apostles' Creed. So if you please join me on the screen, let us confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And thanks be to God. As we prepare to enter into a time of offering and thankfulness, we thank you for all the gifts that you've been able to send supporting this ministry. And of course, as we say every week, we'll say it again. Make sure you're okay, especially as we transition from summer into fall. But as the Lord has blessed you, and if it is in your heart to share with this ministry, we thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You can send in a donation, or well, either you can do it online, or send it by mail, or even drop by where, as I always say, we'll wear masks and be socially distant. But again, thank you. Also, too, this month, our mission of the month, is the Star of Hope Ministries in Patterson Project Backpack. It might be hard for you to see, so I'll go ahead and put a slide of that on the recording. But this year it's a little different. In years past, the goal of Project Backpack was to provide 1,200 backpacks with needed school supplies for children in the Patterson area through churches and civic organizations and community outreach so that the kids can have what they need to learn. They still would like to provide 1,200 backpacks, but also too, they're changing it up a little bit because of the times. And they are also looking to, uh, to donate 1,200 personal toiletry and hygiene kits that have a brush and a comb, a washcloth, a toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, soap, case, shampoo, body lotion, so that the kids can stay safe as they enter into the community. Also, too, they hope to um, raise enough funds for 20 Chromebooks in order to help a private Christian school which is not eligible for state aid. And so thus, if you uh, have uh, the desire and the ability and some, some funds to spare and would like to send it in and designate it for Project Backpack, we would be most grateful as well. Thank you. And let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for all your good gifts. And we thank you for the gifts that we have received this week and over the weeks that we may continue to, well, to be your church in this time and in this place, in this challenge that we face. Thank you for all your gifts, and thank you in particular for the gifts for which we have talked about just now. For it is in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. And let us sing the doxology together. Oh, mm -hmm. 
that everyone is well and safe and even though we cannot um, always mention the specific concerns that each of us might have, please know that, that the Holy Spirit, which indwells within us as a gift from God, knows the desires of our hearts and can often pray in words that are too deep for our understanding and bring them before the throne of God. On a more uh, sad note, I just learned that this past week, uh, one of the uh, previous church secretaries from back when uh, Pastor Bender was ministering, Lynn Worth, passed away this past week. She turned 84 on August 18th. And then just a few days after that, she, well, went to sleep and didn't wake up. I got a call from her daughter, Jennifer, who asked uh, for uh, your prayers and just to let you know that uh, we will remember Lynn in our heart, hearts and thoughts and prayers. Let us turn to God in prayer and let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, even your son Jesus had to decide when to set his face toward Jerusalem to finish the work you gave him to do. Help us also in our decisions that we may have insight and wisdom and courage to make the right choices and the strength to see them through. Hear the prayers that we offer for all your faithful people, that in the ministry to which you have called us, we may serve you in holiness and truth and love. For without love, all our deeds are worth nothing. Since by your spirit, the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to pour into our hearts that most precious gift of love. Help us recognize how we may see Jesus in our own decisions so that we may be living stones for the building up of your holy church. This we ask in Jesus' name, with you and the Holy Spirit are one God now and forever. Gracious God, we pray once again for the health of those who are listening to this or viewing this broadcast, that they may be well, for those who are about to undergo medical procedures, we ask that they, those procedures go well and that any anxiety that that may generate is minimized. We pray for those who have had procedures that they may continue to strengthen and heal and get back to, well, the way their life was before the procedure occurred. For those who exhibit chronic pain Gracious God, we pray for strength each and every day in the face of such a constant reminder of our human frailty. We pray for our doctors and nurses and medical staff. May you continue to support them in the good work that they do to keep us safe. For our essential workers who, well, arrive and show up and, and do what they are tasked to do each and every day so that our society and culture may continue to move forward. Thank you, Lord, for those who, who deliver the goods, those who, who transport, those who mine the cash registers and the stores, and all of, all of gracious God, who are involved in just helping us to be a people. We ask, Lord, that those who have experienced grief and the loss of a loved one, even this past week, as we know with Lynn, may find comfort and solace in your gracious love and word. Lord, we have students getting ready to go back to school on a secondary level, elementary level. We have students getting ready to go to college. In fact, they are already on their way. And we pray that however this semester ends up, whether it's hybrid or remote or a combination therein, that they may learn to the best of their ability. And even though the system will not be perfect, Lord, please help us keep pace and not lose ground with the education of our youth and children and young adults. 
That means, Lord, those who have to travel to get to school or travel to visit, because it's still summer, Lord. It's Labor Day weekend in a little bit. That people may arrive at their destination safely, enjoy their time, and return home in a safe manner as well, to lift up their hearts in their own home. Lord, we have an election going on this fall, and we pray that you may guide us as we seek to, well, to vote, knowing that you have already elected us through the strong name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for those who serve us in uniform, home and abroad. We ask that you keep them safe, and especially those who find themselves in harm's way. In all these things, including those prayers that lie deep within our hearts, we lay at the foot of your throne. As together we offer up our prayer that our Lord taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us close this day's worship with our closing hymn. Thank you.
thank you once again for joining us for this time of worship together. Recalling, of course, as we go forth from this place, that we are the body of Christ together and individually members of it, so that as each of us seek to discover or discern that gift or talent that God has given us, we may use it for the glory of God. That is our true spiritual worship this day and always. May God go with you until we may meet once again.